You're making one right decision today. You're listening to Handcuffs and Sage. Three badass moms bringing you all the true crime and paranormal your heart desires. I'm Red. I'm Timo. I'm Dre. And don't let your kids listen. Seriously, just don't. Hey, it's Handcuffs and Sage. Hey, hey. Woo! (laughs) (laughs) Wow, this is Red. This is Timo. Yep, this is Dre. Hello, hello. How are you guys? Uh, everyone. Oh, well, man, Dre is so strong. <laughs> I'm, I'm dehydrated, and your uh, your brain is fried, right, Red? Um, no, I'm actually kind of feeling adrenaline right now. Oh, kind of right. funny. Hyped up. All right. I'm hyped because the story just took me uh, all sorts of different ways. I wasn't expecting a full load like this, but I'm really excited to talk about it. So my adrenaline's oh. kind of up. So how was your week? How was your week? Oh, how was my week? Um, I It was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember. Yeah, oh I don't even gosh. know. I don't even know. I mean, <laughs> I, I got together Friday night with some some girlfriends that I haven't seen like since way before the pandemic. So that was kind of fun. And yeah. then um, and then we had Bunko on Saturday and that was that was fun. It was just kind of like we were home by 830. So it was it was what? Uh, yeah, That's some early, early night. I know. Bunko. Well, it started at six and oh. then um, and literally it was right up the street from my house. So uh-huh. um, yeah, I, I don't think anybody I don't think everybody was like in the mood to Bunko. And it was like a really weird like I think maybe like like total four bunkos like throughout the whole night like for everybody combined oh wow and yeah it's just kind of like a weird night and um that's what happens when i can't go i know right that's red red wasn't i know it totally but dude um our girlfriend that hosted her backyard man is like the party backyard i was like dang Mm. girl dang girl But the weird thing is, is where she lives is in the same neighborhood that my ex-husband used to live in. And their Mm. model is the same model as my ex. So like I walked in, I'm like, oh, nice. (laughs) This is really nice. I love the layout. I love everything about this house. (laughs) Oh my gosh. No ask really, them where yeah. the bathroom is. Yeah, nope. Nope. She goes, Well, you know where the bathroom is. I go, Yep. Uh-huh. And then the, the the funny thing is my well, not the funny thing, but it was my mother in law's house before it was my ex's house. Oh. So yeah, that was a fun place to go. So yeah. Mm. Oh mm, crazy, honey. crazy. I All know. Oh well that's fine. But then you walk that's... into the backyard and it's like a totally different world. So I'm we played right. outside, so it was cool. Like I didn't have to be in the house very much. So it was it was good. Good. Cool, I'm cool. glad. I'm glad. Yeah, but we missed you, Red. And we I missed know. you too. I mean, Miss uh, Vegas, Viva Las <laughs> Vegas over here. Viva Las yes. Vegas, baby. I, I still can't believe the experience we had. So I was just telling Timo that um, we got really lucky, actually. So my brother has a friend in a very high place, apparently, who has um, a condo in like South Las Vegas called Turnberry Towers. And um, he gave it to my brother for the weekend just simply because my brother is a veteran. I love it. And it was like a thank you, you know? So my brother and his wife were like, well, who should we invite over with us? And they chose us, which is really cool. Nice. Um, Nice. So we got like a condo on the 40th floor of this like super nice, it was like really very nice place, you know? Um, Like has like, gated security and all that stuff you know um but being up on the 40th floor like looked out to to vegas and it's just an amazing view Mm. and super scary because i'm afraid of heights and i started having nightmares (laughs) (laughs) i did the Mm -mm. same thing i can't be that yeah yeah i like walked up to the edge and i got super like sweaty armpits got like all stingy and i was like oh i i can't you can't yeah it's it's a lot Mm-hmm. But we um we had good food. There's this amazing sushi place out there called Yama Sushi. Holy bananas, guys! Mm. It's all you can eat. So you better mm. believe I was off diet. I didn't mm. intend to do that. 
I did not intend to do that, but it was so good. Um, mm. I just ate way too much and I drank a lot of White Claws. Well, I can't remember the last time okay. I've had sushi. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Definitely oh, before pandemic. Sushi. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Love, so, love. so this is interesting fact here, and I feel so bad. My husband, I don't know how we've stayed married this long. We've never <laughs> had a weekend <laughs> away like this. <laughs> you guys are so cute. Oh <laughs> We're God. celebrating nine years, right? We've been together a little bit more than that, but celebrating nine years of marriage. And this is like the the only like the second time in our whole nine years that we've actually been away from the kids. That's crazy, girl. That's crazy. Yeah. But what you, you walked in guy. on, Red, was she said alone time. She didn't say like, you, you know, she said alone time. I'm like, well, you had alone time when you guys <laughs> made Jonathan. Uh, I'm I like, see, I see. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That didn't count. <laughs> I meant like going away for the weekend, like just, right. being, you know. Yeah, gotcha. And that stuff is Un so unattached. important. It really is. And it's yeah. hard when you have little kids to do that. It really yeah. is. You know oh, what it goodness. is, too, is I, I come from like a, a culture where like, and you'll hear this a lot. Parents are like, I already raised my kids. Like, I'm not watching your kids so you can go have a good ass time in Vegas. Mm. That, that's not going to happen, you know? So we I don't get that. I don't understand yeah. that. Mm -mm. Yeah, we I don't can't have wait that kind of. Grand baby. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, ooh, Ricky, as soon as, you know, as soon as you want to <laughs> get out, you just drop them right off. It's like, no, mom, not doing that. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you oh, are. Because yeah. you're going to want to go out and you're going to want to go spend time with your, you know, significant other or whatever. So. Your special You'll lady. See. You'll see. Yeah. Uh, Dre, when is your actual anniversary? It's actually on the 24th of September. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my anniversary is coming up on the 5th, and we're also going to go to Vegas. What? Mm. So we're just uh. copying you. We just want to be just like <laughs> you. Don't be weird about it. Go to Yamasushi. Oh, oh okay. All right. I will. Go. Yeah. So okay. good. So this week, I kind of said, like, my life felt like a country song this week. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. So yeah. like, crazy stuff happened for me. Um, lost my job, and my grandpa died. And I was really, really, really unhappy at my job. You guys know. I was really unhappy at my job for a long time. I didn't want to lose my job, though, because... The hubby already lost his job because of COVID and I, it stressed me out, but it was really odd. Like the moment it was done, like I cried a little and then all of a sudden I realized, oh, oh no, I'm free. Like, yay, mm -hmm. right. I'm so mm -hmm. free. And then like, I just felt lighter and happier and just like, like all of a sudden, like I can do what I want to do. You know what I mean? So it's really interesting in that way that we really try to put something off, right? Because it's a habit, yeah. right? It's what mm -hmm. we know. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, when you're faced with it and you have no choice, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy. I am I really am. I'm so happy. But cool. my, okay. yeah, my my grandpa hadn't been doing well for a long time. And then this this month, it really escalated and things happened and he ended up um passing away on Saturday so it's just sad that you see people at the end of their life and what they go through right and we don't want our loved ones to be in pain and so that that's really hard and then also you know when someone passes away at this time during COVID you can't just get together for a funeral right? You can't just right. do those mm -hmm. things that you normally mm -hmm. would. So that adds an extra layer there. And it was actually my grandma's birthday on Saturday, his wife, she she passed a while ago. Um, but it was her birthday and he passed on her birthday. So hmm. I just think that, you know, he's at peace. And so, I, you know, I'm sad he was in, in pain, but I'm glad he, he's, he's not in pain anymore. So Right. right. It was a really, really intense week, but good things still happened along with the bad, right? So yeah. mm -hmm. um, I kind of went down my own rabbit hole with my story. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm, I'm wondering what it is. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know what I was thinking, girl. I don't even know oh, what God. I was thinking. <laughs> uh, this is going to be like a 100 part series. 
uh, a true crime. But oh, okay. it, it's just, it's, it's so much, it's so interesting. And something, you know, about me, well, my husband asked me the other day, is there a Guinness Book of World Records for podcast listening? You should look into that, right? Uh, like, yeah, for like, sure. Like, like constantly, right? <laughs> I wonder I how they would, it. um, how they would do that though. Cause they have to have a, like a recorder there recording everything. Oh yeah, for, for sure. Oh. Like, I don't even know how that no, would work. I'm I, sure, I don't even... I'm sure iTunes would have that on record from mm -hmm. how you oh. listen. Yeah. Hey, I wouldn't be afraid to check that number. Dude. <laughs> that is afraid. awesome. Afraid. But I love, love, love podcasts. Right. And I love true crime. And um, I feel like I've heard just about every serial killer. Right. Uh, this is about a serial killer that I've heard of, but I really, really have never learned about. Right. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of people haven't. And I think that's really interesting that there isn't more talk about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple books. There's, and I'll talk about this later. There are some podcasts like Morbid uh, covered it, My Favorite Murder. Um, and then I found this podcast called True Crime Bullshit. Oh, oh my oh. God. Okay. I, <laughs> All right. I love finding a new podcast. It gets me so hot. And then they did a thorough deep dive on this serial killer. And I found it so interesting. And they play a lot of the interviews uh, with him. I wish like we could do that. I have no idea even how, how that works. It's just so, so interesting. And um, he really is a, a McFuck face to the 10th degree. He's, he's just the worst. Okay. Um, yeah. So the story I'm doing Damn. is Israel Keys. Ooh. <laughs> no? Is that Nothing? an island somewhere? Nothing? What? Israel Keys. Really? Really? <laughs> I went there in Bakehead last year. It was amazing. So much fun. I had the cocktails. <laughs> um, you guys, this is what I'm talking about. A lot of people haven't heard about him. Have you heard about him, Dre? I haven't. This is, this is nuts. Yeah. This is wow. insanity because of everything he did. So for me, I would hear things a little bit about him here and there, like, um, oh, he thought he was so smart and he was such a planner, but he was really a fucking idiot. Like I heard like little things like that, but I really didn't know the story, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my, I don't know how many hours this week <laughs> I spent. Really? <laughs> doing this story. Um, you know, probably just to deal with everything going on and there's more to come. So it's, it's a lot and it's a lot of, you know, to take in, but, um, I'm, I'm super stoked to share what I found so far. So, okay. um, let me cool. move some stuff. Cause all of a sudden I'm feeling super cramps over, over here. Hold on. With your mounds and mounds of notes. <laughs> Pictures. Okay. I have mounds of notes. I showed the ladies before we yeah. started. Like, no. That joke. gives me anxiety. You know, that, <laughs> you know the meme of Charlie Day in uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where he's got the board behind him and he's like putting mm -hmm. all these things together? That's how it felt for me this week. <laughs> That's absolutely what happened here. It's, it's crazy. That is hilarious. <laughs> Ugh. I am drinking Corona Premier, not sponsored. This is a mm. low carb, low calorie beverage, and I enjoy it. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any limes, so that's kind of mm. a bummer. Oh. I actually a... have um, I have my little. I'm going to show you guys, and I know Red knows what I'm talking about here. I have my little refrigerator here. <gasps> Yay! That's a real oh, working refrigerator. I didn't little... even know what that was. It, it's yeah, it's really high. It's a little, and then there's room it's for like four drinks. It's so there. fantastic. So Dre yeah. brought me over a fridge at a time that I, I I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> it was bad, and she stopped by the house, and uh, she's like, "Oh, I have a gift for you," and 
it was the cutest like little retro like mini fridge and every you know I hope you all know by now red loves retro I love it mm -hmm. and it has like coca-cola on it and it's just so darn cute so it's going to be for our um podcast studio that I'm obviously revamping now that I have all this time on my hands and my son always jokes around when he comes into the office my office um are you sponsored by coca-cola because i have <laughs> coca-cola pieces all yeah. over the place i should be um but it was so darn sweet and then i opened it up and it was filled with uh bud light seltzers which are my fave faves so thank you i really yeah. needed that boost at that moment yeah so, well when i saw that really i didn't know what it and we was can all use it so yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, it was just my thank you. I know that she's really busy and such a giver, you know, you and Steph are the same way. And when she brought me my family dinner, um, because she knows I'm so busy, I was like, well, I didn't have time to make dinner, but I have this really cute thing that I wanted to give her. I actually really bought it with plans to give it to you for like Christmas or something. Oh, but I, <laughs> but I was like, then. I now, did. now is the time now. So yeah, I, so that, it was really sweet. It really thank was. you. No. Oh my goodness, you guys. We're all such lovely ladies, aren't we? Yes, I think so. Yes. All day, every day. <laughs> all day, every day. Give and give. Well, I got y'all witches hat. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah. Super cute. Can't wait for it to get cold so I can wear it. Yes. Yeah. How would you describe them? It, it's almost like a beanie, but then in the back it turns up so it looks like a witch hat. It's so darn cute. Well, oh, it's made adorable. with some really stiff yarn or, or something. So it kind of like makes it stand up to a point mm -hmm. at the end. It's so awesome. I love it. It's so cute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Super cute. All right, y'all. Here we go. So buckle up. We're going to yeah. go on a crazy train and talk about Israel Keys. Okay. I'm going to tell you everything okay so israel keys was born january 7th 1978 in richmond utah and this date stuck out to me because it's right before my daughter's birthday and so i know he's a capricorn and i kind of got a giggle because on morbid podcast they talked about how he was a capricorn and capricorns are planners right uh -huh. they they're planners, they're leaders, they're overachievers, and he really used that, really? that Capricorn sign for his <laughs> advantage and things. Yeah, definitely, 100%. They're no-nonsense people, right? No-nonsense, they, they do what they say, they mean what they say, but they're also like the most loyal. I, you know, I have two Capricorns in my household. They're a, a pain, but fantastic at the same time, so. Yeah. So he's a Capricorn. He was the second of nine children, holy cannolis, and he was the first son. His parents were Heidi and John Jeffrey Keys. Um, they talked about Heidi. His mom really liked to change and hop around with religions a lot. She was just kind of like feeling each thing out a little bit, but they all kind of had like the same idea. Um, they grew up uh, as fundamentalist Mormon, okay? So there's a difference between fundamentalist Mormon and reg Mormons, okay? So I was actually raised in the Mormon church, right? I did 18 years hard time, y'all, okay? Mm -hmm. But the fundamentalist Mormon, actually, they separated from the original church after uh, polygamy was banned, right? So oh. I was part of the church that said no polygamy. Their part that said, oh, hell no, we want all the wives. Okay, so mm. there was that wow. separation there. Um, so for them, they really didn't believe in government interference, uh, public schools, modern medicine, okay? And I really think this attributes a lot to Israel and his early childhood and kind of what made him, you know, be who he ends up being, okay? So they move, move to Colville, Washington. They live in the frickin' woods, like straight up off the grid, living in the woods. There's no heat or electricity. Do not sign me up. I never wanna live like that, 
The okay. whole family? The whole fam bam are up in the woods. Oh my god. Living like no. This. Yes. no electricity. No electricity, no heat. That's I'm nuts. always cold and think about being in Washington with no heat. What? Ugh. Mm. Of course that's gonna mess up a kid. <laughs> I love it right now, man. I'm like a hot flash bitch from hell. <laughs> well, check it out. Live in the okay. woods in Washington. You're going right. to love it. Mm. Okay. So what's interesting is because of the way that they were raising their kids, you know, Israel never had a birth certificate, no school records, no doctor records. They were homeschooled, right? Not not a lot going on there, okay? So they were up in the woods uh, building cabins and, and things like that. So then his parents decide to leave that fundamentalist Mormon church, okay? Then, because Heidi likes to jump around in the religion, they become fundamentalist Christians and then became part of this church called the Ark, which is very racist and anti-Semitic, oh. like oh. dark shit, like extreme stuff, right? All Intense. right. Probably not, not great for kids. Okay. So in the late 1990s, the family moved to Moppin, Oregon, and then uh, later moved on to Maine. Okay. Wow. So something that Israel talks about in interviews, and this is going to happen a lot, is stuff that he says in these interviews, um, is when he was growing up, um, everyone was very nice to each other, right? The kids were very nice with each other, but he thought that they were all faking it, that, that they were like him, but they were pretending to be nice. But then at some point oh. he realized, oh no, they're not faking it. They actually have feelings and I don't, which is terrifying. Okay. Awesome. Wow. Isn't that uh -huh. one of the, the um, key signs of like a sociopath? Like yeah. they can fit in and pretend. Yes. So we're going to talk yeah. about that. They can compartmentalize like nobody's mm -hmm. business, right? They can be different mm -hmm. people at different times and it doesn't matter to them if those things are conflicting with each other. So it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, he said that in his childhood, he felt like he might be a demon child Ooh. because he didn't have feelings. I knew Timo would be into it. <laughs> <laughs> a demon child, you say? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, he said finally in his 20s, he didn't feel bad about the way he was anymore. You know, he didn't care that he didn't have feelings anymore. And he finally came to terms that people were not the same as him. He was definitely different. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I have a kind of a fun story here. Um, <laughs> terrifying, actually. Oh, so Israel, when they were little, uh, Israel's sister had a cat, okay? Oh, God. If you like cats, you shouldn't <laughs> listen. Okay, here we go, y'all. So his sister has a cat. This cat keeps getting in the trash. He's annoyed. He tells his sister at some point, if the cat gets in the trash again, I'm going to kill it, right? So he then decides the cat has got to go and he takes the cat into woods and he's not by himself he has a couple kids with him okay so he takes a parachute cord and he ties this cat to a tree <laughs> oh no i know i know and he has a 22 revolver i mean what kid doesn't have a 22 revolver honestly he shoots this cat in the stomach and the cat starts losing it and is like running around the tree and then it crashes into the tree and then this poor kid's cat is like throwing up, right? It's this horrifying scene, horrifying, oh God. poor cat, awful, right? And he's laughing the whole time. He thinks it's hysterical. And then wow. he looks over to the kids that were with him and they're, they're horrified. They're disgusted. He said one kid was throwing up, right? So, I'd be throwing up. right. So he was like, oh shit, 
right? What I thought this was hilarious. So one of the kids told their dads, the dad told Israel's dad, right? And he said, that was the last time anyone went in the woods with me. And then he starts laughing. Oh, jeez. <laughs> this was an interview? Yes. Oh. There are a, a ton of interviews. I've How listened creepy. to so many it's so creepy, interviews. but all yeah. I have to do is watch it now. <laughs> and I know you do, too. Oh, <laughs> girl. The interviews are... There, there are just times where you just feel sick to your stomach listening to him because he's telling you these crazy things that he did. And at times he yawns, like it's not a big deal. And most of the time he's laughing. Oh, geez. It's crazy town. <laughs> it really makes you sick, like how people can think, right? Um, he would break into houses as a kid, of course. Of course he did. He would steal guns from houses and, and hide them. He, he was doing all sorts of devious things as a kid. He said that he knew since he was 14 that he wasn't normal and that he didn't think like a normal person. Um, growing up, he did have friends though. So we're going to start talking about what Dre was saying is that they can compartmentalize and be different with different people, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's just crazy with him is that he's able to have long-term friendships, relationships, and, and we'll get into that too. So that also makes this one, or it, it, it's really hard to understand. Um, so growing up, he had friends, Chevy and Shane. Chevy. <laughs> I said Chevy. And Shane, uh, they were part of this crazy church, this really racist church. Both of them committed crimes um, just all the time, terrible crimes. So Chevy and his father uh, once robbed a, a gun dealer and got all sorts of like guns and ammo and cash. Um, Chevy and a friend once kidnapped and robbed this family called the Freedmans. Um, this was a Jewish couple that owned a store. Um, and then in 1996, Chevy killed an entire family, mm. okay? These are his friends, all right, y'all? Take your friends wisely. Um, and then in February 1997, you know, him and, and Shane were part of a shootout with the cops. The cops did survive, but Chevy was convicted and got three life terms, and Shane got 24 years. So these are the people he's chilling chilling with okay um and then he starts seeing someone we're gonna call annie okay not her actual name and her family became friends with like his family and they went to the same church so they were all a bunch of racists okay great was Who this guy good looking? looking was this he guy was good okay looking, looking. Mm -hmm. okay now so kind of like a ted bundy but Interesting you say that, Timo. <laughs> we'll get back. We'll get to that. All right. The Ted Bundiness of this all. Uh, so he has this friend, Annie, and they start to date. And the families are pretty like, woo about it, right? Oh, we're okay. kids are in love, right? Um, so at the same time, he's dating Annie. He's stealing guns. He's hiding them all over the place. And then finally his parents find the guns that he's been stealing from peeps. And they told him, okay, you need to apologize and return the guns. And oh, there was God. no charges brought against him, but that was his punishment. <laughs> so again, everything has contributed to the way he ended up, right? Um, in 1996, before they moved to Oregon, his crimes escalated, okay? He committed his first bank robbery in Washington. So bank robbery is craziness, but it's not the craziest thing he ends up doing. But he has his first one before they move to moth in Oregon. So then in Oregon, he's working for the family to build them this log cabin, right? Um, he still stays with Annie. 
And Andy and him send like letters back and forth to each other, right? You know, they're in love. And then he says around 18 years old, he actually starts looking into Satanism. Wow. Um, yeah, so he, he grows up in a very strict religious home. And now he's like, all right, now I'm going to look into this new thing, this Satanism thing, and see if it's for, for me, okay? Oh, right. So he talks about in an interview around this time that where he was working to build this this log cabin these other things that there was like a river and on the river there was you know beaches and when it got real hot out a lot of people came to like hang out there and he's talking about how there's like girls in their bathing suits there right and there was some kind of remote restrooms nearby and oh God. he he ends up taking a girl, right? He takes a girl into one of the restrooms. He had planned this out. He had looked at this bathroom, the area beforehand. He had really wanted to do this, but what he wanted to do was kind of different than what ended up happening. But he took this poor girl, probably like between 14 and 16 years old, into the bathroom. He ties her up and he rapes her, okay? just fucking awful he's awful so he he rapes her and he said really the intent here is that he really wanted to kill her okay that's what he wanted oh to do um and he was talking about how when he was thinking about his first murder he really needed someone kind of small right to be easy to dispose of their body uh, oh. this is the type of stuff he says just over and over again in these interviews and he laughs through throughout telling it it's sickening um so the way that this girl handles this event is absolutely amazing okay so really? okay she stays calm she doesn't freak out she's not screaming or anything like that she says you know um i'm not gonna tell anyone right uh it ain't no thing uh i'm just gonna deal with it right he said that he kind of like knew what she was doing like to calm him down and that she was like really uh -huh. smart like with all the stuff she was saying um she said to him at at some point during this you know you were a really good looking guy you do not have to do this um, I would have gone out with you, right? And she just keeps talking. She just keeps talking him down and staying wow. calm. And he talks about how she didn't act scared. So maybe he thinks maybe something had happened to her before. And so she knew how to like deal with that situation. Because, you know, in the future, when he attacks and rapes or whatever he does, people are mm -hmm. freaked out and scared, right? And that's just not how she handled the situation. She was a boss about it. Um, he is upset still that he chickened out from killing her. Like wow. he still holds that, that he's, he's upset that he didn't do that. Um, he's just a piece of shit. So then he joins the army, okay? He joins the army in 1998 and the deployment actually ends the relationship with Annie because she doesn't want to like be waiting around for him during his, this time. Um, he's in the army from 1998 to 2001, but he talks about being in the army in this interview, okay? So he's talking about how the army really kept him busy and kind of balanced him out, right? So he really didn't have time to do the things that he was interested in doing, right? Um, and then he also really started to drink a lot. He said to temper a lot of the urges he was having. Um, there were times when he was into like being branded with hot metal <laughs> in the army to like chill the fuck out, which is insane. Yeah, I don't know. Um, he did go to sex workers during the army, right? As one does, I guess, I don't know. Um, 
there was one girl, he's telling this story about this girl that um, he was with in Tel Aviv. I guess she was actually like a foreign exchange student there. Um, and the way he tells the story is disgusting because he's like, it wasn't really rape because she like asked me to her room. Uh, and it's like, uh -huh. oh, okay. All right. That was rape, buddy. If you're wondering, it was rape. Okay. Um, and then he said, actually, this event kind of changed him because he could have gotten caught in this situation uh, by his anyone in the army because they really keep tabs on you, like everything you do. So he feels like that's not the smart thing to do from now on. It's only going to be strangers that I attack. Mm. and hurt okay so along the way he's changing the way he's thinking about everything um it's weird because i didn't even think about this but the investigators are asking like you know did you just like hook up with women you know or maybe sex workers that were male and he really is kind of dancing around this right and i think if the answer was no, he would have just said no, but that's not what he said. He said, well, if you want to have sex with a woman, you have to pay for it, right? But with men, it's really easy. You just hook up with men. Hmm. Um, I was like, okay, I don't even know. But I thought that was really interesting that he didn't say no to being with a man. Um, in June 1999, his former mentor, Annie's father, died and so he drove 350 miles um to go to his wake in colville and so then while he was there him and annie were like what's up what's up right but then annie was like i don't know if we should get back together because you know he had been sending me some pretty messed up letters <laughs> when he was away i don't know if i want to get back into this um so she she was actually you know kind of thinking about not being with them, but then she gave him another chance, which she shouldn't. And um, in September 2000, they got engaged, okay? Um, he said, hey, Annie, just giving you a heads up, girl. In January, I have just like a bunch of training days and I'm not gonna be available to call you on the phone, okay? Um, she's like, all right, cool. So then he goes and the opposite happens. He calls her like nonstop while he's away. And she said it was very odd. Like he was just calling to like complain about, you know, army people being weird and doing ecstasy and shit. I don't know. Um, so he's like calling her, calling her, calling her. And then all of a sudden it stops. Like no more calls. She was like, that, that's odd. What's going on here? Um, she says when she thinks about it, it's just very, the whole situation was odd and she doesn't know what actually happened during that time. Um, and then he doesn't call her at all. And wow. they were engaged and <laughs> he completely cuts her off like months before their wedding and he vanishes. <gasps> oh, he ghosted his fiance. He ghosted her in like the coldest way, like didn't even give an F so mm -hmm. so rude okay um so we're talking about serial killers compartmentalizing right that they can have different personas and be different people and mm -hmm. really not care right what they uh -huh. do yeah. to each person in, in different situations and that's definitely something that he does okay well, you know this dodged a bullet guys oh yeah, yeah. Lucky no, lucky. Shit. no <laughs> shit um Psychologists talk about how all women, all women, <laughs> all humans are actually able to do this, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe we're more professional at work, right? And we really watch our P's and Q's and with our girlfriends, you know, it's just dildos and cocktails, right? <laughs> we're, we're different with different people, <laughs> sure. But, ser right? but serial killers take it to like level 10. It's like mm -hmm. a master thing that they can do. Um, so in December 2000, there's a single mom, her name is Tammy, and she's living in Tacoma, Washington, and she goes in and she's checking her Match.com account, Ugh. and Israel has a Match.com account, and let me remind you, he's engaged, this piece of shit. Okay, so 
she says they're not even like matches really because he put on his profile that he was <laughs> he was looking for a white woman between the ages of 18 and 21 near Colville, Washington. That's all they want is the 18 to 21. That's, that's all they want. <laughs> um, Tammy, was at, Tammy was actually 10 years older than Israel. Um, she wasn't white, right? And she actually messaged him to tell him his audio greeting on his profile was messed up. <laughs> <laughs> she said, hey, your thing is not right. And so she walked him like through the steps of how to do it properly. And then they ended up talking and then they have their first date, December 7th, 2000. Again, he's engaged. Okay, thank you. Um, Tammy has an eight-year-old son named James. And James later says that Israel was like out of all the guys that um, his mom dated, he liked Israel the most. Wow. That, yeah. And so that's yeah. the real thing about this story is that mm -hmm. he's able to have good relationships with women, long-term friendships, good relationships with kids, right? People would say he's mm -hmm. a good guy and he's not. He's the fucking worst, dude. Okay. So February 2001, two months into the relationship, Tammy tells Israel, I'm pregnant, okay? I don't know who does that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Me and my hubby do. Okay. <laughs> so um, he did not take this news well, okay? He did not want her to have this baby. He, he like, lost his shit. And she said, peace out. I'll, I'll take care of this myself. Okay, friend? Like, she was not even having it. So mm -hmm. in March, she took a job as an early childhood case manager up um, in Nia Bay for the Macaw Tribe. This was Northwest up in Washington. And she was going to have this baby and do her thing, okay? Israel became extremely depressed and withdrawn. He was not doing well. Um, he had cut himself off from Annie, right? And then now he's cut off from Tammy. So he's a hot mess. He really is. So he confesses to the affair to Annie, right? And then he also denounces God and our religion to his family. And Annie was like, I can forgive you for the affair, but I cannot forgive you for denouncing God. So it's over, homeboy. Yeah. Oh, so wow. then Annie's like, peace out. I don't forgive. Mm -hmm. So then Israel crawls back to Tammy. Okay. In July 2001, he actually goes and moves in with her. Okay. Um, He's talking about in these interviews how after he got out of the army, he was really bored. And this was really bad that he was bored because then he needed to fill his time. Okay. Mm. So Israel is a true crime fiend. He loves to read about serial killers. He loves to watch horror, violent films. It's his shit. Okay. And this is when his killings begin. And he talks about it wasn't long after he got out of the army that he, uh, he started his shit. So they were living in Mia Bay and there's only 900 people there, like crazy, 900 mm. people. Uh, the macabre tribe there has a ritual of burning possessions after you die and then throwing the possessions the burn possessions into the sea. And this is something that we'll actually see later on with them. I think it's really interesting. Um, so he's saying in the interviews, he decides, he knows it's only a matter of time before he's gonna kill people. And he's gonna do it his way and he's gonna plan the fuck out of it, okay? It's gonna be planned and he's gonna know exactly how to do the whole shebang, okay? Um, if the person isn't connected to me, then I can't be looked at. So he's definitely decided to do only strangers, okay? Mm -hmm. He ends up getting a job with the Macaw Tribe um, as a parks and recs manager, which is 
not good because that gives them all the access this crazy bitch wants to the macaw land. Okay. Mm. It's just mm -hmm. acres and acres of land. It's insane. So he likes to fish and camp and, you know, and do all these things, but he also likes to scout out places to murder and bury people. Sure. Of course. Right. He likes to do all those fun things. Um, and they're saying the FBI investigators are saying that this is where five Washington state murders happen. Okay. In October, 2001, they have their daughter and, um, just because they call her Sarah in uh, true crime bullshit, I just thought I would do the same thing. So let's call her Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, they lived a normal life, right? He was a good dad. He worked really hard. He took his stepson, you know, James hiking and fishing. He would braid Sarah's hair. He took her fishing. There was absolutely no aggression at all from him with the family. Everyone thought he was just this really great guy, but really, um, he was just killing people all over the place. So he was completely different, which is just insane, it really is. Um, so the interviewers are really, really trying to get all the information out from him that they can. And it's like pulling teeth with Israel. And in everything you listen to, he really makes it difficult every step of the way talking about what he's done. And we'll talk about later why that is. Mm -hmm. um, but they want to know about uh, his first murder. Okay. And he says it definitely went better the second time around. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Right. He said he had the area picked out. Um, he had it really set in his mind how he wanted it to happen. He had been going, you know, through different areas to, to really map this out. Uh, he said that he did strangle the victim. He tied them up. At one point, like, the interviewer kept saying, like, did you strangle her? Did you tie her up, right? He kept saying her. And then at one point, your zero's like, why is it a her, right? So something... Mm -hmm about Israel that is just crazy time is he kills men and women, but no children because he has a daughter and no mothers, hmm. which is very interesting. And he will kill from late teens to elderly. So really crazy profile because usually with serial killers, it's like, I like them blonde poets, right? Right, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. not with him, right? He's just down, 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 but not kids. So then you're like, so he has feelings, right? So mm. he, he does care. So that's why it's, it's a really hard thing to come to terms with, with him. It's just very odd. Okay. Um, so they believe that this, killing took place between July and October 2001 before Sarah was born. Tammy talked about how they had had a neighbor that went missing while on a hike. Uh -huh. And the, the body was found much later. It was ruled an accident, but she didn't see Israel that day or night that this neighbor went missing. And the name of this hiker is actually like redacted in, in the files. We don't know what the hiker's name is. But in interviews, Israel gives clues about how maybe one of his killings was ruled an accident. Uh, okay. okay. And how maybe this was kind of a mistake on his part because he's usually very meticulous and has an alibi, right? an alibi ready to go. But in this situation, he didn't have an alibi. And so he had to put the body in a position that made it look like an accident and just hoped that they didn't find the body until it was like really decomposed because then you couldn't tell mm -hmm. how um, they actually died. 
and he got really lucky because they didn't find that body until it was really de decomposed. It came out, um, you know, in the paper that he was found and that he had died from an accident. So he got really oh. fucking lucky. Mm -hmm. He's, oh shit. Okay. So the family decides, okay, we're going to move um, in March 2007 to Anchorage, Alaska, but actually it's just Keys and his daughter and they move in with Key's new girlfriend in Anchorage, Alaska. So he's mixing it up with the ladies. Okay. So now he's living in Alaska and he's working as a handyman, uh, a contractor, and he has his own business called Keys Construction. Okay. So he's a really, really hard worker. Um, Israel would visit his family in the lower 48 states all the time. He took 35 trips from October 2004 to March 2012. So he would fly to a state, he would rent a car, and then he would drive thousands of miles somewhere else to kill someone. <laughs> oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. He would plan these killings for years ahead. He would leave kill kits in different locations all over the US and then years later would go back to that location and use it in that state. Like where? Are you like, all over. Like burying in like the woods somewhere or like yeah, where? He buried them. He oh would bury kill my kits. My god. Isn't that terrifying? Fucking yes. terrifying, you guys. <laughs> mm. Awful. Because he thought about it and he planned mm. it and he waited and then he went to one state and then drove to another. Like the the time that he put into this is crazy. It really is. So he left, they call them kill kits or um, caches, but he left, left them in Alaska, New York, Washington, Arizona, uh, Wyoming, and Texas. So he's a, he's a busy bee. Um, he said to keep his urges at bay at times, he would do wake in homes and do random arson fires. So, you know, other stuff. He's a guy. Other fucked up shit, right? To calm his urges. When they found, uh, when they ended up going through his house, he had several true crime books and horror movies like I talked about, um, but so do I, so that doesn't mean anything, <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm not sure. putting cachets all over the U.S., okay? <laughs> okay, y'all? Um, Israel Keys talked about when he was like 15 or 16, he had read the book Mine Hunter by John Douglas, an FBI mm -hmm. profiler. And he said it was really crazy weird because he felt like he was just reading about himself, that he was a serial killer. Oh. Nuts. Crazy. That is really weird. Z. Crazy. Um, so in later interviews, he talks about Ted Bundy and their similarities. And it really is quite insane, the similarities he's had with uh, Ted Bundy. And you, you brought up Ted Bundy, like, is he good looking? And right. when you see pictures of him, he was not a bad looking guy. He wasn't. Well, Ted Bundy and, was able to be like in that loving relationship for so many yes, years and yes. take on like the father, you know, role of, of his girlfriend's daughter. And you were saying he was like the same way. So I'm like, hmm, this sounds yes. familiar. Right? Interesting. So they, they had a lot of similarities in that their acts, their murders were sexually motivated, right? We know that that they were very controlled. They had girlfriends, they had long-term relationships, they had kids or, you know, uh, Ted Bundy was like a surrogate stepfather, right? And then later ended up having his own. He was able to have a job for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like he was just all over the place making a hot mess of his life. He was living as two different people, right? Real life mm -hmm. and fantasy. So very similar to Ted in a lot of ways. And like Ted, um, even though they were controlled and planned with most of their killings, at the end, they both got sloppy and they both got caught. So that's what Israel ends up doing is getting sloppy up in here. 
I love that in his interview, he says he hates the BTK killer, that he is dumb and disgusting. And I couldn't <laughs> agree more because I hate the BTK killer. I really do. <laughs> like anything about BTK, I'm all, Hoop! I don't even. He says because BTK killed kids. How did that uh... not mess him up? Because BTK had his own kids. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he has this weird moral code going on. It's very odd. Um, Keys, like Red, did have a favorite. Uh, H.H. <laughs> Holmes. We have the really? same fave serial killer, and oh. it really creeped me out. Oh. Ooh. And you guys are yeah. Capricorns? <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> so I... I love the H.H. H. Holmes, and so does Israel Keys. He loved how meticulous Holmes was, that he was a genius, that he took time to plan everything out. He had a murder castle that nobody suspected H.H. H. Holmes. Everyone thought he was like this great guy, right? But mm -hmm. he wasn't, right? Um, in interviews, he told police that someday he planned for his own dungeon, you know, like a retirement plan, and then he laughs because that shit's funny. Oh right? my God. He's the fucking worst. <laughs> he says he also planned to later on be a traveling contractor and go to natural disasters. And while people were helping during these natural disasters, murder people. Oh my gosh. Right? That's he thought about this guy. shit. He thought about it. Ugh, That's gross. crazy. I know. So we're talking about him being similar to Ted. And um, he actually had a good relationship with Sarah's mom. She said that he was a good father and that he had no anger issues and that it was actually really, really hard to get him upset about anything. Like she said she tried to like, would like try to provoke him, right? to get him going and it just it just never happened he just didn't have it in him to get mad hmm. right i feel like and that's a red flag too though like I you don't so have emotions too. period that's that's yes. not okay that's also you have a to, problem yeah. yes mm -hmm. and so she said he would never get mad and never get jealous and i think about i know this sounds crazy but i think about my dad he is the chillest mofo ever like, he's super like, whatever, it'll work out. Like, always, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. But he has feelings, mm -hmm. right? And I, he can get mad, right? But this is like next mm -hmm. level. This is something else. So I, I agree with Dre, definitely a red flag, right? You don't want any extremes on either side. Mm -mm. You have to have, um, you have to care about something. Mm-hmm. So, like Bendy, I was saying, he got really sloppy at the end, um, and that really ends up being his um, undoing. He had had one rule, and that it was to never murder near your home, right? Because you don't want to be able to be connected to anything and no witnesses. And he says in this interview, because, you know, people disappear all the time, and he starts laughing. Oh it's God. creepy it's so creepy so that's where i'm gonna stop for now okay there is so much more we're gonna get into Damn. what he did it's really intense okay this was a good baby step right <laughs> mm -hmm. Jeez, good yeah. baby step but th this is just a really interesting situation and i find it fascinating um i think that the podcast that cover it did a phenomenal job uh really really good job so um i'm gonna do more lots more notes don't worry you guys i'll do a thorough job <laughs> you're welcome cool hey. cool cool okay so so far that's part one of israel keys such such a mcbuck face yeah right. Yay. that's good yay yeah good job yeah that's bananas i can't I'm wait gonna... to hear more I'm going to have to hold off on listening to those interviews until we're done. I know, huh? <laughs> like, I want to yes. hear it all, but at the same you time, guys, like, there's ooh. so many, 
interviews and then later there's going to be pictures that we'll talk about and those oh. will haunt your nightmares really oh no. yeah you guys i looked up one picture i'm not going to mention what it is at this point but i looked it up and i was like <gasps> <gasps> oh. yes really yes. yes oh no okay yeah we haven't even gotten into it. I know this wasn't much, but I really think it's important to know. I think it's important to know, you know, with serial killers, is it nature, nurture, what contributes, what are their signs, right? How do we yeah, get yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. to certain places with them? It's just really fucking crazy, you guys. So much more to come. Yay! Okay, Woo! cool. Yay. Cool. Cool beans. We're going to do a little history lesson here. Okay. Yay! I love history mm -hmm. podcasts and history. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you <laughs> the history of the Ouija board. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Stop it. I saw so, the cutest Ouija board dress at a store uh, I was looking at. It was so oh, cute. Yes. It was like an overall dress and it was a Ouija board. Oh, damn. Mm -hmm. Cute. Yeah, it was really it's cute. really cute. Very yeah. Cute. Mm -hmm. Like they until the demons some. possess your body. Yes, <laughs> you know, for fun. There's some really cool um, fabric that I like that I wanted to make a, a, a purse out of, but I just never got around to it. And Aww, it's just, there's still time. I know. There's it's still just, time. You know, I don't have a sewing room, which is what I really want. So like, I have to like take the sewing machine out and, you know, do all that stuff. So someday. You could take someday. the kids out for you. Yeah, I know, right? For your sewing time. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the perfect craft room. I'd love it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I got the majority of this um, information from the Smith, uh, the Smithsonian Magazine. It's uh, .com. So it's the one that's actually on, on the internet. And this is exactly a quote that I got from them. It says, the Ouija board is a tool of the devil. Um, no, is it uh, the tool of the devil or a harmless family game or even a fascinating glimpse into the non-conscious mind so we're gonna it, i've never did a deep dive into like all this information about the ouija board i just know all like the crazy bad stuff that you shouldn't do with it but mm -hmm. i learned a lot today and it, it's cra it's crazy it's pretty bananas uh, so the f fun fact, the makers of the first talking board actually asked the board what they should call it. And it gave the answer Ouija. Really? Yeah. So, wow. Um, everybody it, thinks, okay. So should we say Ouija or is it Ouija? It's Ouija, but, okay. um, you know, people call it Ouija too, but okay. like everyone thinks that it, it comes from the words yes in French and German. So we, ja, but it's not, oh. that's not where, that's not where it came from. It came from, okay. they actually, so, but I'll tell you like the, the, the whole story about that later on down the line. So in February of 1891, so the, the first, itself. yeah, <laughs> so, uh, so in February of 1891, the first ad started to appear in newspapers, you know, back in the day when we all had newspapers. Um, mm -hmm. And it What's was- What's a newspaper? What's what a newspaper? Exactly. What? Get your fingers dirty. That's what it did. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know what was so weird is I always thought about how people would serve food in the newspapers. And what, what, why would that wouldn't get like black? ink stuff all over your food it's kind of weird right but you know what was fun is putting that putty on your oh, comment I, and yes. then like pushing yes, it down really putty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. newspapers are cool man you can read them <laughs> but you really could just do the putty that's yeah. fun mm -hmm. or you could do paper mache oh oh so are many fun. yeah it's fantastic. <laughs> you can move stuff with it i mean come on yeah, wrap your um, ceramics that you buy or you, in Timo's um, story here, uh, succulent pots that I buy. <laughs> I like the, yeah. Succulent pots. Succulent <laughs> pots. Wait, okay, so you said that they serve food on newspaper? Yeah, they used Am to do something. 
Um, yeah, back in the day, they would put like um, they would like wrap up sandwiches and things, wrap like up sandwiches. Oh, or like, okay, okay. Like, Instead of like like crab yeah. boils, they would like oh, just put it on newspaper. Yeah, it was so crazy. Like yeah. fish and fish and chips was served on newspaper. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back in it the day, like long, long better. time ago. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> maybe mm, they maybe the nice. ink was different back then. Yeah, maybe it wasn't like how ours. It's probably was. organic, and ours has like GMOs mm, yeah. and shit yeah. in it. Thanks a lot, <laughs> newspapers. <laughs> but now if you go to like a fish and chips place, they give you like fake newspaper. That's like right. parchment. So it's, it's like wax yeah, paper. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So these <laughs> ads read Ouija, the wonderful talking board. Okay. So this is how they started promoting it, right? And basically in um, yeah. Pittsburgh, it boomed in this uh, toy and novelty shop, uh, describing it as a magical device that answered questions about past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. So they're like really selling it, right? They're like, okay, here we go. Marvelous. And then it always promised that it would give you never failing amusement, amusement and recreation for all classes. And I just think that's so funny that they said that in the advertisement, all classes, because, you know, back then you had the poor and the this and that. And then, yeah, so. Yeah, and we don't have that now. Everyone's yeah, the no, same. Everyone's the same. <laughs> everyone's the same. We're all poor. <laughs> but they're no not. Classes. We just don't really say it anymore. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> So they sold this back then for a dollar and fifty cents. Fancy. Yeah. Damn. Dollar fifty. And you know at that time somebody was stressing about that, making that I thing know. Handing that dollar fifty. Oh my over. god, that was probably a lot of money too. Like that would probably buy groceries or something. We should look it up. It's probably like fifteen million now. These yeah. Days. Yeah. I love yeah. seeing inflation. This is in eighteen ninety. Yeah, eighteen nineties. One dollar and fifty cents. All right. So what what is it? It's a flat board with letters of the alphabet arranged in uh, two semicircles. Um, above, uh, there's numbers ranging from zero to nine, and then the words yes and no are in the upper corners, and then there's a goodbye at the bottom. All right. So this is basically uh, not the Ouija board or Ouija board that we know today. These are like the cool like wood ones that were like all fancy and carved and all that mm -hmm. stuff, right okay, but it never so it never changed like the 50? Look, okay i'm so sorry that's okay go ahead sorry a dollar 50 in 1890 is now worth 42 dollars and 84 cents damn for yeah. rich people i wouldn't that's, i wouldn't that's be buying a week before this yeah, yeah wow. 42 dollars for that a game was a lot of mm -hmm. money okay yeah. that's a lot of money can yeah. you see how much a Ouija board is today? Like, it, let's say, like, from not target. that like, much. It's like, no, I don't think it's like forty-two dollars. Yeah. yeah, no, <laughs> not, not the game game one. Maybe one like you'd get like at Halloween Town or something because they have one over there that I love. Oh, and I like want. the real so nice bad. yeah antique mm -hmm. looking ones. Mm -hmm. So Walmart has them um, for seventeen twenty-nine, and okay. Macy's has Talk them for twenty-five dollars. Okay, twenty-five. Right. Yeah. But those yeah. aren't like, they're just the little cardboard ones. Yeah, the little cheapo ones. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, there's a vintage spirit. 1972 one <gasps> on eBay for $18. Okay, wow. can you get that? Click. <laughs> Click purchase. No, don't. Thank you. Please. Got it. No, I'm just we're not, we're not buying. Yeah, we're not buying those. I, I will never touch one, guys. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I can't. It freaks me the fuck out. I'm not even playing. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. Nobody's forcing you, boo. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> tell you why. That's exactly the way you should feel, girl. Right. Tell mm -hmm. me. All right. So then it has the uh, tear-shaped planchette, and um, it has a little circular window in the body of the planchette, which is uh, used to maneuver around the board. And then the little window goes over the letters um, and the yes and the no and the goodbye and all that good stuff. So the idea of the Ouija board was to have two or more people, they'd sit around the board, place their fingertips on the planchette, ask questions, and then the planchette would move from letter to letter, spelling out the answers all by itself. Okay, so that was the, the main idea of what, what it would do. The only difference of the Ouija board between now and then is today it's cardboard, back then it was wood, and the planchette is plastic. 
and the planchette back then was wood too. So it, I can see maybe why it was maybe $40 back then in the day because it was mm -hmm. actually like really fancy carved wood sure. and it was, yeah. So, I mean, it was craftsmanship, you know, back then. Now it's just like right. multi, you know, factory made, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the uh, the patent office, so you know they wanted to patent this this board, and um, they actually proved it to work, and that's how they got the the uh, the patent. To I love it. Uh, a little bit down the line, I'm going to tell you the whole story about how that happened too, and that's that, okay. that's just hilarious. But even today, psychologists believe that um, it may offer an actual link between the known and the unknown. So it's really a great area on, on people that do believe and people that don't believe. believe. So uh, yeah, that's fun. I, I really like, like that part of the, the story. Ouija, a Ouija historian, Robert Murch, actually has been researching this since 1992. And he was really surprised because uh, no one really knew the actual origins of where it actually began and where it came from. So he did like a total deep dive and started learning some crazy, some crazy, crazy shit. Mm -hmm. So one thing that he couldn't realize, he couldn't like fathom was for such an iconic thing that strikes both fear and wonder in American culture, how could no one know where the Ouija board came from? So he's like, all right. I'm going to figure this shit out. I'm going to do it. So um, for, for one, it came right out of, of the American 19th century obsession with spiritualism. So, mm -hmm. you know, back in the 1800s, like everybody was like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They wanted right. to do all the things that had to do with talking with the dead. Um, and this was one of the tools that they could use that mm -hmm. for. So spiritualism was um, around for, for a really long time in Europe um, before it actually came to America. So it, it basically hit America really hard in 1848. Um, and it was all because of the Fox sisters. Okay, so these two little sisters lived right. in New York, upstate New York. So they were very wealthy. You know, they had the pretty dresses and they were just well to do and da da da. But they claimed that they could speak to spirits and they received answers for special questions just by um, knocks on their house, like around. So they basically traveled all around the state and they would go into people's homes and they would perform this special uh, ceremony where they would ask questions and then they could hear raps on all the doors or the walls and they would be able to um, translate that into answers. Now, I don't know how they actually did that, if that was true or not. So we're going to say they were they were the real thing and they, they really did this stuff. <laughs> it's fact. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. 100%, yes. So uh, spiritualism basically reached its peak during the second half of the 19th century. And it really didn't affect like Christianity or Christian values at all. So basically one person, like you could hold a seance Saturday night, like throw the big party for the seance and, you know, talk to the spirits and all that. And then you just go to church the next morning on Sunday and, you're cool. There's nothing. So there's there was no with issue with that. Yeah, right? no. It was just like a fun way of way of life back then. Okay. Um, it was just it was wholesome. It was acceptable. Um, they they had little get-togethers where you contact spirits. You did seances. You did automatic writings, and you did table turning. Now this is I. I'd never heard of table turning before. No, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Well, you know, idea. automatic writing is when you have to have a, a, a medium involved. And supposedly the medium will sit there with a pen and paper and the spirits will speak to them and then actually start writing through the, the medium. They so, will write out what yeah. the spirit wants. Right, right. Oh, so that there, would be fun to do. Yeah, it's really fun. So yeah. there is a... Um, a show and it's uh it's called the holzer files i've, I've actually talked about it mm -hmm. um quite a bit so hans holzer he's not alive anymore but he was like big time like a uh, ghost you know paranormal investigator um and he basically had a couple mediums that traveled with him and he did some really big cases and he actually taped all his stuff but it's on those big round you know tape reels like back in the day the old old-fashioned tape mm -hmm. recorders the flammable so, ones that will kill everyone. If a, oh, yeah, that's the fire comes near. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. uh, so 
in the Holzer files, they actually have his daughter and then they have a paranormal investigator guy and they're basically uh, listening to whatever investigation he did at that time. And then they go back and they just re-examine the whole thing. And then they have this really cool girl. She's so beautiful. Um, and she is a medium and she does the automatic writing. So she'll just go into like a room and sit down and she'll literally just start like going into a trance and start writing. And it gives answers of like what they're, what they're investigating. It's so bananas. That's um, how I felt this week, <laughs> writing out these notes for this oh, story. Yeah. <laughs> I was in a trance and I was just writing. My hand hurts. Oh, I We're bet. the same. Oh my yeah. gosh. Didn't our, our medium that came over, didn't she mention automatic writing or she, I know she was scribbling. I remember she had mentioned that she was scribbling when she I was doing the, right. the stand. So did she say yeah. what she was writing out or no, would she, she was write it out like, and then say what it was? Is that yeah. what she was doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like uh -huh. like she wrote like a number. I remember one time she wrote like a number mm -hmm. and she's like, I see this. Um, but there's also this other little uh, medium dude. His name is Tyler Henry and he's called the Hollywood medium. And I think he's on I the I follow East. him on the gram, y'all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he does, he doesn't do automatic writing, but his writing actually gets him into like, I think it basically gets him to where he can focus on the spirits and not on anything else. So he just kind of does mm -hmm. all these like scribbles and he mm -hmm. gets those to the people that he's reading and they like hang them up like get them framed oh, and hanged so up fun. yeah it's so I fun right someday for mm -hmm. sure yes. right okay so this table turning you guys so um basically the participants would sit around a little table they put uh they put their hands flat on top of the table and then they would like like really concentrate and i guess the the table would shake and rattle on its own um, but then it also offered what they said it offered uh, sol solace to um, people during this time because it basically kind of gave them the idea that there was life after death because during this time, again, like we talked about last week with the Victorian era, um, the average lifespan back in the 19th century is like 50. So uh. even though it's a lot old, it's like 10 years older than before. Um, it gave people solace that, oh, you know, there is life beyond death and we can come back and talk to our loved ones or, or whatever. So basically, w during this period of time, women died in childbirth. Women are always dying in childbirth. Um, children died of diseases and then the men died in war. So that's why the, the average um, lifespan was around 50 during this time because it was in you know, World War One and all that. Sicknesses, so, so. right? Yeah. Lots mm -hmm. of sickness. Yeah. And then another fun little fact is um, Mary Todd Lincoln, wife of Abraham, mm -hmm. conducted seances in the White House. I after, love it. Yeah, after their 11-year-old son died um, from a fever yes. in 1862 during the Civil War. So, uh, yeah, I mean, can, can you imagine, like they say that the White House is haunted too, but, you know, all that stuff happened back in the day. So, ooh, uh, that's fun. Uh, it's an old building. I wouldn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it especially gained popularity with people who were desperate to speak to their loved ones who went away to war and never came home. So oh, that was another heart. tool. Oh, that, yes. yes. That was it makes another. sense. It yeah. makes sense, right? It, mm -hmm. It's normal for people to want to know that their loved ones are in a better place and they're okay. So doing right. stuff like this totally makes sense. I've done it myself. I've seen psychics, right? And things like that. And it does, it makes you feel better yeah. when you hear certain things. It and it sense. wasn't, back then it wasn't thought as like weird, like you were a kook who, who talked to the dead or whatever. It was just like kind of like the norm, like everybody did it. Or if mm -hmm. you didn't do it and you knew somebody that did it, it was just, yeah, whatever. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're just going shopping at the grocery store, you know, like no big deal. Mm -hmm. You don't seance, O-N-G. I know, Okay, right? everyone mm -hmm. seances here. Right. The American culture started to get frustrated with the amount of time that it took to get answers when they would hold seances and do automatic writing. Like it would take like, you'd be like, hello, are you here? Hello. And then it would take Is forever. So, on? Yeah. So Americans were like stoked because they're like, we're going to get immediate answers with this Ouija board. Like we ask the questions and it just starts going and we're going to get our answers. So in 1886, um, the press started reporting, I went press, 
I just totally yes, like we heard it. We okay. heard pop your we heard when it happened. <laughs> yeah. pop, pop, pop. pop those okay. pies. <laughs> so the press started reporting a new phenomenon taking over the spiritualist camps in Ohio, the talking board where you could get an immediate response from the spirit world. So that's how they sold it. Okay. So originally the Kennard uh, talking board didn't have a name. Okay. So this is what they did. Um, they brought in a medium and the medium used the board. And then that's when the spirits told her to tell them to name it Ouija. And the actual pronunciation or the actual definition of Ouija is good luck. So that's mm. kind of creepy if you think about it. They're like, okay, good luck. Good luck. I could right. just visualize like the medium feeling pressure to pick like, a fabulous yeah. name and is like looking around the room and sees we, 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 uh, ja, ja, we, ja. She's like, uh, blue plate. No, that's not going to work. That's yeah. not going to work. Yeah. Let yeah, me try no. it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, okay, so this is the story of when they went to the patent office. So it was February 10th, 1891. They went in there with this board. They wanted a patent. And the chief patent officer was like, mm, I don't know about this. This is kind of like whatever. So he's like, all right, give me a demo. And if it tells me it's my name, if it knows my name, then I will give you the patent. So they did the demonstration. Now, whether they, you know, they got into the spirit world or they knew what his full name was walking in there it spelled out his whole full name and they got Ooh, the patent I isn't that crazy it. yeah that's Did so he crazy his pants? he's like here here you go he was. The patent in their faces. yeah he was like get out. white and shaking and he's <laughs> like okay you can have it <laughs> Okay, so in 1892, the Kennard Novelty Company went from one single factory in Baltimore to two in Baltimore, two in New York, two in Chicago, and one in London. Dang! So it blew up. It blew up. Yeah, so now it's more than 120 years uh, since the original one was marketed, and it's still um, being made. It's uh, today, it's just like family entertainment. What but families also, are getting together to play the board? I know, isn't that funny? Oh, and gee, <laughs> Satanists, Satan families. Right. Um, and they said that it appeals to uh, people of all uh, ages, professions, and education. So uh, I don't think four year olds are into it. Yeah. You know, I that. don't know if you guys know this. This is crazy, but I know that um, they were complaining about it because I, I can't remember which store it was or whatever. I think Hasbro is the one that makes it now, right? But they um, mm -hmm. they make it in a pink. Yeah, <laughs> you know, to so like you know they it's they're targeting that demographic because guess what? Right. Like little teenagers, they wanna they wanna mess with it. Like light as a feather, stiff as a board. Ooh, little little. Support. Baby witches mm -hmm. in the making wanted the Ouija. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I did. I did play the Ouija board when I was younger. Yeah. I've never like played it. High. Yeah, oh well, God. I did too, and I can tell you guys some stories, which you I'll guys never are do. Cool. Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they said that um, basically what it offered was a way for people to believe, and people want to believe in um, – the, the the idea that something else is out there. So this was a very popular and very powerful tool um, to sell to people, like whether it was real or not, people believed and that was the best thing that they got out of it. So uh, during um, uncertain times, which we are in an uncertain time right now, so I'm very curious if it's happening. What are you talking about, Tina? <laughs> what are you saying? I would love to see if the Ouija board sales went up, but like during uncertain times, the Ouija board sales would just go through the I can the see roof. that, sure. Yeah, so yeah. in the I tens, answers. yeah, so the tens and twenties during World War One, Prohibition, there was totally a huge surge in, in popularity. And then we have another little fun fact here. Um, in May of 1920, Norman Rockwell, who usually illustrated the blissfulness of the 20th century, you know, like just happy families and everything. He actually did do a painting and it depicted no. a man and woman with a Ouija board sitting on their knees, communicating with the beyond. 
and it was actually on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Isn't that cool? Wow, that is yeah, so cool. I would love that picture. I've I never love seen it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Have, I've never seen it. Yeah, me neither. I've never no. seen it. Yeah. Ooh, we should find it. I bet Dre could find it. I could. Yeah, right, I'm Drake. actually I'm stretching right now. You have that, five the, seconds. <laughs> I'm, I'm stretching. I have so much <laughs> back pain, guys. Oh, Carly no. is not my friend. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm like sitting on the floor. <laughs> but you can still hear me great, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So in 1967, one year after Parker Brothers bought the game, they sold 2 million Ouija boards out Dang. selling Monopoly. So this was <gasps> in the 60s, like the late 60s, early 70s. It outsold was still, Monopoly? It outsold Monopoly. Yeah. It's been going that strong for that long. I am actually really shocked because that was the game, right? Monopoly that was, was the, the game, shit. And right? think about all the Monopoly boards that are destroyed out of anger right. and frustration. And then right. you have to <laughs> buy another. And they, they oh, sold yeah. more Ouija. But, That's crazy. But what was happening during this time? Vietnam. Okay, um, there was the Summer of Love in San Francisco, and then they had all the race riots that were in New Jersey, Detroit, Minneapolis, Milwaukee. So here we are again in this huge, like, you know, uncertain times where all of a sudden everyone's buying Ouija boards. So that's why I'm so curious as to what. Oh, there it is. Oh, Look. Dre found it. It's great. That's awesome. That's amazing. Ooh. I want that. Ooh, yeah. 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 It's, I've it's never nice. seen that before. I love it. Yeah, it's so awesome. Good job, Dre. Proud of you, girl. Yay. <laughs> All right. So we were talking about newspapers earlier. So the Ouija just came out and was in the newspapers all the time. I'm going to tell you some really fun little stories about what happened. So in 1920, and I'm not putting these in any order, so we're going to hop around. In 1920, uh, would-be crime solvers turned to the Ouija for clues in the mysterious what? murder of a New York City gambler, Joseph Burton Elwell. So I think that's kind they of They were cool. like, we don't got any clues. We don't right, have right. no fingers. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Like, what about going Ouija yeah, We're going to yeah. figure it out, eh? It said no, and then it said yes. Now we still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. So much, yeah. <laughs> All right, you're going to oh love this gosh. story, you guys. <clears throat> so in 1921, a Chicago woman that was actually being sent to a psychiatric hospital um, for being, um, for suffering from mania, actually told um, the doctors that the Ouija board spirits were the ones that told her to leave her mom's dead body in the living room for 15 days and then to go bury it in the backyard. The board told her to do it. Of yeah. Course. yeah. Did the doctor say, oh, mm -hmm. okay, cool. Yeah. Sure, fine. sure. Yeah. The sure, board said to, to kill and leave the body. That's what you do every oh, time. She just kind of left it there for 15 days and then she Gross. Just buried it in the, yeah. In right. 1930, two women in Buffalo killed another woman because the Ouija board told them to. Of course it did. Hello. <laughs> In 1941, a 23-year-old gas station attendant from New Jersey joined the army because the Ouija board told him to. No! Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All these life decisions, you guys. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, Mrs. Helen Dow Peck died and supposedly left $152,000 to Mr. John Gale Forbes, who was a spirit that she talked to on a regular basis through <laughs> the Ouija board. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, yeah, so they actually took that one to court, oh. and the judge said, yeah, we're not following the Ouija board. So I whoever, don't think yeah. we're going to do it this <laughs> yeah. time. I love it. And then in 1916, Mrs. Pearl Curran made headlines when she started writing poems and stories that she claimed were dictated to her via the Ouija board by a 17th century English woman named Patience Worth. Okay. Oh, that is such a, a name for that time, Patience. Patience, yes. Ugh. God, I'm glad I wasn't named Patience. Be I, like, or name Prudence. does it match your personality? 
Prudence. Yeah. I like that prudence. Prudence was prudence? one of the girls. Yeah. Oh, on, um, charm. No, terrible yeah. prudence. Yeah. Like a prudence. prude? No, yep. thank you. Yeah, I know you wouldn't like that one. No. And then the next day, Curran's bestie, Emily Grant Hutchings, claimed that her book, Jap Heron, oh. um, Jap Heron, I have no idea what that book is. J A P and then Heron. It sounds like, like the you're bird. being racist. I know, right? On our podcast. <laughs> no, I I'm not. It. I won't. Um, have it. It's a it's a pretty a pretty popular book, I guess, because she claimed that it was communicated to her via the Ouija board by the late Samuel Clemens, who we all know as Mark Twain. Oh yeah, I've heard of Mark Twain. Sure. Yeah, sure. So in 1973, what movie came out? The Exorcist. And everybody was just Ooh. wild and crazy about the head sure. spinning and the pl the split uh, pea soup barfing, but it all started from a Ouija board. Even the true story that the exorcist was based on was all started with the Ouija board. So mm -hmm. this is what started people getting freaked out. Okay, mm -hmm. um, little fun little fun fact too. In 1951, read an I Love Lucy episode. Yes. When Lucy and Ethel hold a seance. They actually use a Ouija board in that episode. Yes. yes. Oh, I haven't seen Lucy that. Lucy does it. I have to do have it. Have you seen that episode? I have. I thought I, I saw remember them all, that. I don't remember that one. I don't remember oh, them seeing a, using the Ouija board. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. So basically, overnight, the Ouija board became this tool for opening up the door to to hell and talking to the devil. And um, most religions, mostly. Catholicism denounced the board because it was Satan's preferred method of communication. All right. 2001, people in Alamogordo, New Mexico decided that they were going to burn Harry Potter's books and they were going to burn Snow White. And you know what they did? They just decided to throw the Ouija board along in there with them. I don't know what's up with Snow White or the Harry Potter, but yeah, these people were cray cray over there. They mm. run into it, man. Sorcery. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then in 2011. Well, like, isn't, isn't the Snow White story? What? Isn't it like a creepy, like, isn't the yeah. Snow White story like a super creepy original? Like maybe right. that's what it has to do with. Well, there are religions, right? Anything to do with sorcery, right? They, they're not mm. going to have it. So maybe that's why they went loco. Well, also mm. she was living with like seven men and she was a single woman and whatever. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so judgy. Yeah. <laughs> um, in 2011, the 700 Club host Pat Robertson declared that demons can reach us through the Ouija board. Oh, and even in the paranormal yeah. community, you guys, even in the paranormal community, um, it has a bad reputation. Um, it's got a bad rap? That's yeah, we just don't really like it. We don't want to use it people are afraid of it it's really bananas um so going back to tvs and movies it was used in paranormal activity one and two it was used yes. in tv episodes of breaking bad and rizzoli and isles i never saw that show um but i think they were like two cops or two detectives or something like i don't detectives. know i don't know and then of course multiple multiple paranormal reality shows they're, they're always doing that and then one of my fave little stores, which I might be too old to shop there now, but Hot Topic sells gothy Ouija board bras and mm. panties and all kinds of different little things nowadays. <laughs> so like you said, you found that dress. So It was super yeah. cute. Yeah. I feel bad because maybe it, it does just have a bad rap because when it started out, a lot of people got comfort from it, right? Hearing from their loved ones. Right. Um, I'm thinking that maybe the, the stories of the bad things that happened because of playing with it, um, which could possibly do a whole nother episode for me to do, uh, just yeah, bad stories sure. of people playing with mm -hmm. it. I think that's what um, started people being afraid. And I know when I, when I watch my, my ghost shows and there's mediums on there, they always say you have it's a perfect tool to use. Yes, you can use it, but you have to know the right ways to use it. And most people do not know that. So they use it the wrong way. They don't do the proper blessings and, you know, say goodbye the properly, you know, the proper way and all that good stuff. And then the bad things happen. So I think that's what's, what's going on with that. Um, hey, I would love it if our listeners would um, chime in 
Yeah. Yeah. Tell us. I know, like in our in our demographic, it's really common that that we have used the Ouija board in our like younger years. So if any listeners have stories, share them in. I want to hear all the stories. Okay. I remember yeah. in the fourth grade, my best friend had a Ouija board and I really wanted to play it. But again, I was raised in a very strict religious home yeah. and uh -huh. we were not a play play with it. And I was so upset. Yeah, but you would have burned in there hell. There has to be stories. There has to be fun yeah. Ouija stories. So send yeah. them to us. Yay. So I'm going to end with my personal story of mm. when I played the Ouija board. I played it multiple times with two of my really good friends that I grew up with. One, um, I literally grew up since like first grade. The other one I met in junior high school, and this was in junior high school. So I grew up in Glendale, California, and there is a um, very popular uh, park. It's called Brand Park, and down the street from Brand Park is a cemetery. Now, this cemetery made uh, news back in the 90s because the uh, funeral director or the mortician or whoever was there on site was selling plots to people and not burying the people in the plots. What he was doing oh, was no. oh. in the bodies and throwing them into a big pit behind a building oh my on God, site. I didn't know that. Oh, yes. my oh my God. Oh my God. So when he got caught, they basically shut the cemetery down and they would not allow anybody there, which was horrible because people whose loved ones were there couldn't go there to visit. So now it's this reopened. This is so sad. But it's reopened during specific times, specific days. And I believe you need to show proof that you are going to go see your loved one. Well, when I was in junior high school and I went to school literally like four or five blocks away from this cemetery, me and my girlfriend would go and we would do the Ouija board in the cemetery on oh, top of Grace. Oh, crazy. I know, yeah. right? Whoa. Was it at what? night? Did no, it was during, at night. Okay. No, it wasn't at night. It was, it was, it was during it's the fine, daytime. You guys. Nothing really crazy ever happened, which is the strange <laughs> thing. But then I had another girlfriend, Laura. This is my girlfriend, Laura, that I met in junior high school. And uh, she came over to my house one day. We decided that, and I was a latchkey kid. My mom worked so late, so we mm -hmm. were all by ourselves. Yep. And we sat on my bed, and we started playing the Ouija board. So um, I was sitting with my, on my, we were on my twin bed. I had my back to the wall, and she was sitting in front of me. Uh, and with her back to like a wall unit that I had. So I lit a candle that was on the wall unit. And then I had a huge like poster picture frame thing behind me um, uh, above the wall. So we're playing it and it's getting all crazy, right? We're kind of provoking it. We're kind of being nasty to it. It's like, show yourself, do something. We were crazy. Little junior heart yeah. bitches over here. Uh -huh. And it was getting all crazy and doing all some weird shit. And I said, show yourself, blow out that candle and we're looking at it, nothing happens, right? So we're just da 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 So then all of a sudden I look up like a second later and the candle's out and we're like, what? And then the whole picture frame that was behind me freaking flew off the wall <gasps> and landed right on top of me and on the board. Oh. No, I never played it again after that day. I was hey, fucking so scared. Period. Yeah. And that's what started. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh no. Oh. That's a crazy story. That would freak yeah. me out. I never played yes. it again after so that. So that day. makes sense yeah. to me, right? That's yeah. a terrifying mm -hmm. event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Now it I've could never have all played. been coincidence. The candle could have burned out by itself because it was you know. And maybe that was it. We we lived in Glendale. We were on the Andre Andreas fault or the San Andreas fault, whatever it's called. You know, maybe mm -hmm. there was like some little yeah, who knows? But Crazy. to that day, mm -hmm. I will yeah, I will not. Maybe play there's the a Ouija scientific board. reason. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll look into it. We'll figure yeah. out what happened that day in junior high. It's Don't worry. Oh, so bananas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it would be really fun to have, I'm still in contact with Laura on, on the Facebook. So it'd be really fun maybe to have her come on and we, we can talk about it. We also did some other naughty things. There's this book called the Necronomicon. You're not supposed to say that word like more than once ever. It's a very scary book. It has to do with like just really bad stuff. And we were really into that too. So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were little, into like, it, man. Pushing yeah. the limit there. Yeah. Oh so yeah, gosh, I, might, I, I, I might hit her up on on the Facebook, and we'll be like, "Hey, you want to like talk about our experiences?" <laughs> yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it. So there you go, Ouija board Yay! and Timo's. Uh, yeah, Timo's story wow. there. Wow. Yeah, I was Woo! a ballsy, ballsy girl back then.
Mm-hmm. You do what you want, girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. It's that time for Bad Ass Story of the Week. Of the week. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready for yeah. a Bad Ass Story. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. we need it. We need it. All right. So I have a, a really cool one. Thank you to Red for sharing this with me. Ooh. Um, oh. Oh. Earlier in the week. oh. You okay. know this one. Okay. Um, it's actually kind of awesome. And I, I was thinking about what this kid went through. So there's a Connecticut teenager. Yes. His mm. name is Justin Gavin. Shout out Justin Gavin. Hey, Our Justin hero. Gavin. Now this guy, um, young, young man, he actually saved a woman and her three children. Okay. Wow. So imagine okay. you're walking to Walgreens, you're walking down the, st- down the street, going to the store, and there's a car driving by and it's on freaking fire. Crazy. The car's on That's fire. So crazy. Oh, and the lady's like, doo, 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 driving down. The street. <gasps> He's like, lady, stop, stop. Your car is on fire. Your car is on fire. You need to get out. And so I guess like she had trouble getting it to stop. And so he's on foot and then he like chases down the car. He says that he didn't know. Um, he just knew that he had to help, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like, you know, people have that fight or flight, baby, and they right. just go. He took off. Away. He, yes. he went and wait, he wait, went wait. to go help. It, so, was, it was on like a, like someone, like you guys saw it, like happening where he's like running for it? No, no, no. I'm just oh. giving you a really good visual. Oh, oh <laughs> no, no. Because Red was like saying like, he ran fast. I was like, what? You guys no, I know. <laughs> he, oh. he took off. Like, because so he many people off. would see that. Gotcha. All right. I was and like, dang. Oh, right. no, no, no. Start freaking recording with their phone. Let me videotape this shit. Right, for, right. You know, whatever. Sure. So, no, he didn't do that. He went <laughs> and he ran after the car and he's yelling her at her to stop. Um, she couldn't stop the car, right? But it eventually does come to a stop. And then he just said he felt like he you know, he had to do something. His instincts instincts just took over. So he gets to the vehicle um, and he helps her out. And then he looks in the back. Oh, mind you, when he sees the car driving by, he sees a little girl in the back of the car. So he knows there's like passengers in the car. So he gets the lady out, the car's on fire. And then he realizes that there are three kids in the back seat. So there's a four-year-old, a nine-year-old, and then, of course, the one-year-old's, like, in a little baby car seat, right? So he Uh, saves all of their lives. Like, meanwhile, nobody else is, like, doing anything. Cars are honking at her and stuff, but, (gasps) you know, he just got to it. And then he said that as soon as, like, he got them out, like, he turned around, and the whole thing was just engulfed in flames. That's so crazy. That's crazy. I got killed. Uh, 18 years old, and he's like, nope, I'm saving your life. He um, didn't hesitate. I love it. Yeah, he did not. Yeah, so just he's just a, a superhero, my goodness. And um, he, he ended up getting like a, a coin from the chief of police. It was called a challenge coin. He was awarded um, this challenge coin for his courageous act. And then he just smiled and oh, you know, he's, he's just being a kid. And oh, mm. what, a, what a wonderful little, you know. It's fantastic. Little yeah. he, had, he had a moment a chance to step up and he stepped up and he saved mm-hmm. people i love that story good yeah. job and then awesome. it's so crazy you look at that car that whole car is like demolished it's like super engulfed in flames mm-hmm. i just don't even know like how did she not look she didn't know the car was on fire she couldn't know it wasn't that she didn't know she couldn't get it to stop mm-hmm. so oh my just God. crazy i think about getting all three kids out of the car like in the blink of an eye that way that's not even possible, you know? Uh-uh. It's like, a lot. Go, 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 go. Yeah. He did a really so, good job. He's an awesome little badass. Wow. He's Yay. a badass. Way to go, good Justin. Job. Good job, Thanks Justin. Thanks for sharing the story, Red. Yes. Good job, Dre. Good story. I liked it. Good times. Mm-hmm. All right. You guys can hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok. I'm missing so many. All of TikTok the things. Facebook. For a little bit longer. TikTok for a little bit Is longer. Is it going away? Yeah, November, I think. Well, it's supposed to go like soon, like the next couple of days, but like the writing between the lines uh, per Perez Hilton, because I love him and I always follow him on TikTok. There's like, it's going to like totally go away in November, but like if you want TikTok now, you guys download it because after a certain point, you're not going to even be able to download anymore. And then it's just going to slowly disappear. So for Aww. as long as I can, I'll make my videos and then eventually we'll lose it. But 
I oh, am. That's a bummer. When I you know. share those stories, oh mm-hmm. my goodness. I'm like, cool, I'll look at that one and then I'll close it. And that never freaking happened. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, an hour later, I'm like, what am I doing? Oh, I'm I just know. learning how to like, you know, unplug, unclog a drain. I'm following this like lady who's a housekeeper. <laughs> Why the fuck? I don't know. Cool. <laughs> I follow I know, a mortician. <laughs> All this sorts of fun possibilities. She's teaching yeah. me how to clean everything. I'm not even a housekeeper. I just want to know That's how to cool. keep my fucking house clean. I dig it's it, so man. I dig All it. Right. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah, share your Ouija board stories, and we will share them, right? That would yeah. be so much fun. We love it. Yes. You can email us at handcuffsandsage at gmail.com. We have a website, Handcuffs and Sage podcast.com. And please, uh, you know, be a badass for us. Stop, rate, review. We have a couple new reviews this week. So I wanted to give a shout out to Sophia and Emma for taking some time and sharing the love. It was really, really Ooh, nice. Thanks, girl. Yay. Thanks, ladies. Um, I think that's it for now. I think we're all good. Good job, okay. you guys. Yeah. Fabulous. Good job. I appreciate love you it. all. Mm, mm, mm. Love it. Okay. Uh, remember... We, we do, do what, what we, we want. want. Woo! Woo! Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. 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 Love you. Bye. 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 Handcuffs and Sage is hosted by Red, Timo, and Dre in a shitty guest room in Los Angeles. Theme music is Leave Now by We Are Wasted. Cover art done by Megan Winchester. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Show some love on iTunes. Be a badass and do what you want. Until next time.